Sam always brought up like bullet coffee uh, that you brought to him. Uh, in terms of your nutrition. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, the, I have written down the, the two things that really stick out to me from things that you said to me. I remember we were talking in like the bubble at a practice one day. And you were telling me about bulletproof coffee and how you like put butter in it. And like, I didn't, mm -hmm. I thought you were just putting like regular butter in there and stuff. And I didn't really understand it all. But go as I, it came up to me, I just remembered you talking about that. So I remember you talking about bulletproof coffee. And then I remember you talking about the idea of like, when it comes to like picking your meats, like the less legs of the animal, the better the meat is to, to eat. So like, Eating yeah, a cow, eating and eating point, point. Is yeah. a cow and then a fish is better than a chicken. So those are the two things that stood out to me. But if you want to just hit on the benefits of Bulletproof, if you're still a believer in that, and then just the idea with the legs. <laughs> okay. Leg thing still definitely holds true in terms of leanness. I would resist the term better because having some fat, some saturated fat in your diet definitely isn't a bad thing. But yes, like beef is fattier than chicken which is fattier than fish so if you're just going pure like i want the leanest meat possible that holds true in terms of like the less legs the better um and then i i don't do bulletproof anymore um i don't think it's a bad thing but i would say the approach i take is like a very simplistic one where like the most important thing in your diet so there's like an order of, there's like a hierarchy in terms of what's important the most important thing in your diet is the how many calories you're getting at like no matter what, like if you're not getting enough calories, like you're going to lose weight and you're like, if you're a professional athlete, you're not going to have optimal energy levels to train. And if you're getting way too many calories, um, you're obviously, you're going to gain weight, which isn't good for anybody, unless like you're trying to build muscle in the weight room and then you want to be in a caloric, uh, excess to help build muscle in the weight room. So the number one thing that's going to influence everything is the total number of calories you get in. So I'm a huge believer in calorie counting. Um, which I know a lot of people aren't and a lot of nutritionists say you don't need to. Um, but for me, once I got, I started doing it and got good at counting calories. Um, I really don't even have to like, actually like look at the labels and count them nearly as much as I used to. You just, especially if you eat a lot of the same things, you just know what things have. So like milk, for example, is going to have like one gram of protein per fluid ounce, you know, like um, like a normal serving of chicken is going to have like 25 to 30 grams of protein. Like you just start to know these things and you don't even have to um, necessarily like count them like on an app or anything. But I think learning how to count calories is really important and learning how to manage your portion size is really important. So then the second most important thing is going to be uh, the macronutrient content. So um, if you're an athlete, you definitely want to be getting enough protein. So making sure you have enough protein. So and a lot of athletes don't. So like the advice I'll give athletes is one gram per pound of body weight. So like if you weigh like me, like 185 pounds, like I want to be eating at least at a minimum 185 grams of protein a day. And I'll try and do a little bit extra. I'll do closer to like 200. Um, and then in terms of carbohydrate, it depends on what your sport is. Like if you're in a more endurance-based sport, you're going to be eating a lot more carbohydrates in general. Again, there's different diets. It could be a keto diet where you're not doing any carbohydrates. But if you're talking about just a more traditional diet, um, the carbohydrates you're going to like a soccer player is probably going to want to take in a little bit more than a lacrosse player because they're covering more distances at training and stuff. And you guys, the amount of carbohydrates you take in, is going to be a little bit more important than like a golfer or something like that. Um, and then in terms of fat, it's kind of like, it's just, I look at it as like the filler macronutrient to like, kind of just, if, okay, if you're getting enough protein, you're getting enough carbohydrate for your sport, whatever is left in terms to get your total caloric needs, whether you're trying to gain weight or lose weight, the rest is just filled in with fat. Um, yeah, you don't want to be, and then obviously there's fats that are a little bit better or worse than others, like like saturated fat coming from meat, uh, coming from avocados, things like that can be a little bit better than like the unsaturated fat that's coming from um, like things that are in like potato chips um, and different oils like that. Um, so then if you have the total number of calories that you're eating down, you have like the total number of macronutrients down, then the third thing is going to be timing. Um, so again, you don't want to eat a lot of fat, like going into a training session or immediately after a training session, just because fat slows down digestion. It takes a lot of time to get through your system. So you're usually going to want to take in the vast majority of your fat, like well before, or well after training. Um, and then probably the carbohydrate piece is the one that's influenced the most by training is you're going to want to make sure you have enough carbs going into training and you want to make sure you replace those carbs pretty quickly after training. And then protein, 
Um, you definitely can still have some protein before training, but it's, um, it's something that depends on someone's stomach. Like I would have no problem like drinking two protein shakes and then going out and training. They wouldn't affect me, but some people, uh, having a lot of protein pre-training isn't great for them. So it's okay. Let's limit the protein immediately pre-training, but then make sure we're getting a ton of protein post-training. Um, so that the, I would say the, when you're getting the protein, um, it's going to be variable just kind of based on the person. So, and yes, there's like a little bit to like the anabolic window in terms of like your body's more susceptible to like protein synthesis, like the 30 minutes post training when your muscles are working, um, or just coming off of doing a lot of work. Um, but I would say that's less important than the total amount of protein you get throughout a day. So like necessarily getting 30 grams of protein immediately post practice, um, that's less important than getting like the total number through whatever your total number is throughout the day. Um, so then it's, you have nutrient timing is the third one. Then I would say like nutrient quality is the fourth most important thing. So that's when you get into like um, simple versus complex carbohydrates. Um, that's when you get into like how, like saturated versus unsaturated fat. Um, that's when you start to get into like organic versus non-organic um, meat and things like that. Um, and I think a lot of people focus too much on that. Not that it's not important, but I would say it's the fourth most important thing where people and then the fifth most important thing is going to be supplements. Like, oh, how much B vitamins? Am I taking a B vitamin supplement? Am I taking like a vitamin D supplement? Um, how much caffeine am I taking and things like that? So I would say that's the fifth most important thing, but that's the thing I feel like I get the most questions about and people are concerned about the most. Like, oh, what supplement should I, like you get the question like, oh, coach, what supplement should I be taking? Well, it's like, oh, I have no idea because I have no idea how many calories you're eating every day. I have no idea how much protein and carbs versus fat you're eating every day. I have no idea like what your nutrient timing looks like. And I have no idea what your nutrient quality looks like. And those four other things are much more important than how much vitamin D you're getting in, for example. Actually, vitamin D is not maybe a good example because that is an important one. But like vitamin B, for example, like should I be getting more vitamin B12? Like it doesn't matter like compared to like these other things. Yeah. For calorie intake, do you just want to match calories burned versus calories in? If your goal is to maintain where you're at, yes. But so say you're in the off season and your goal is to put on some muscle, then you have to be in a, a caloric surplus for the most part. Like if you're really inexperienced, like you haven't done any strength training before, or you're just really young, like going through puberty, like you can grow muscle, like literally doing nothing um, or like necessarily not having this big uh, calorie surplus. But once you're older, you're more experienced in the weight room things, it becomes harder and harder to put on muscle. Um, so then you definitely, you need to be in a calorie surplus, especially like you need to be getting enough protein to help build that muscle. Um, but then if your goal is to lose weight, um, then you need to be in a caloric deficit. You need to be eating less calories than you're expending. Um, but usually for an athlete who say they're trying to lose a, bit of, a little bit of weight, um, you still want to keep your protein levels super high because that's going to help preserve the muscle mass. And you're just going to cut down on the carbohydrates and fat that you're taking in um to get your total caloric intake lower right i mean it's just like basic like thermodynamics it's impossible to gain weight without being in the caloric surplus and it's impossible to lose weight without being in the caloric deficit so you need to be in one or the other um based on whatever your goal is and i would argue you want to keep protein levels super high if you're trying to preserve muscle mass in either situation and then if you're trying to lose i'll say probably cut out a little bit of carbohydrate, cut out a little bit of fat, and then just kind of play with those two macronutrients to get the desired outcome. So say like you're trying to lose like, like a good goal would be like one to like two pounds a week or something like that. So I'm losing two pounds a week. So say I'm losing two, I'm, I'm pretty good at counting my calories. I'm taking in 2,400 calories a day. I lose two pounds that week. Sweet. Next week I lose two pounds. Sweet. Next week I lose one pound. Okay. Next week I stagnate. Next week, I stagnate. So it's like two weeks of not losing any weight. And it's like, okay, I probably need to either increase my activity or decrease uh, my caloric intake. So say you can't do any more activity like you're already doing a ton. So then be looking, at, okay, I'm typically getting in like 80 grams of fat a day. Let me cut that down to 65 grams of fat a day and then see if my weight continues to go down. One thing you mentioned that I hadn't heard before, obviously you mentioned like the amount of protein intake that you get. And obviously you hear all the time, like drink a protein shake after you work out, replace your protein. But you mentioned needing to get the right carbohydrates in and then replace those carbohydrates after the workout. 
Like me personally, I feel like I've never heard someone talk about needing to replace the carbohydrates after you work out. Why do you have to do that? So carbohydrate is your body's preferred fuel source, um, especially during like high intensity activity. So like a lacrosse practice, for example, is like that's a high intensity activity. So your body is burning like glucose that's in your bloodstream. And then when it runs out of that, it's going to be burning glycogen that's in your muscle. So glycogen is just stored sugar, essentially, uh, or like stored carbohydrate. So you're depleting like muscle glycogen stores and glucose stores when you're exercising during practice. And you want to get those levels back up to normal by eating carbohydrates post-practice. There's a little bit different mechanism with protein because in protein, what you're doing is if you're training really hard, you're damaging the muscle during training. And then you want to make sure the body has like the building blocks, the amino acids, the protein post-training to repair that muscle to come back. So one is like repair and recovery. And then one is just like replenishment of muscle glycogen stores. So you want to, Sam, you want to go ahead before I ask? Uh, I mean, I was just going to, no, I mean, I was just going to ask one other thing with the, with the diet stuff. Um, another thing I saw you kind of tweet about was like with like physical performance, how it's much more important to just be consistent over the long term versus just like loading up for two weeks and just working 10 times harder for two weeks when it comes to nutrition and just like watching your calories and doing stuff like that how important is it to like be consistent with either the types of nutrients you're putting in or the calories like can you like kind of change up what you're eating or is it really just you want to be consistent with that cal caloric type thing or just what's the the parallel between being consistent with working out and just being consistent with your nutrition to some point yeah, I think having variety in your diet does have some benefit, but it definitely, it's not going to be as beneficial as in terms of total caloric intake. So for me, um, and I get that not everyone would be willing to do this. Like when I'm like, things are different now that we're like at the hotel in the bubble, but like for the most part, I eat like the same thing every single day for the most part, like breakfast at the facility, they have like the same offering. So I eat the same thing for breakfast. We, we, uh, for lunch, there's like a little bit of variety at our training facility, but they're always going to have either chicken or fish and then some vegetables. So I'll pretty much have the same thing every day for breakfast, or I'm sorry, for lunch. And then for dinner, I'll usually just do like a protein shake. Like I'll make some sort of shake at home. So like the consistency, like every single day, it's like, oh, I'm almost eating exactly the same thing. And then if I want to gain or lose weight, it's super easy because then I just would manipulate the, the caloric intake. So I would keep like the calories the same or I'm sorry, I would keep like the protein the same. I usually keep the fat the same and I'll just manipulate how much um, carbohydrate I'm taking in. So say I want to gain 10 pounds. It's going to take some time, but like I just start eating more carbohydrate because the protein's already going to be really high. I could probably up the protein a little bit more, but the main thing is going to be upping, just upping your total calories. And if you want to lose weight, it's the exact same thing. It's just, you just manipulate um, like your carbon fat intake at that point. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, I think consistency is so huge. Um, and just tracking your progress over time is really big. And it's things that people aren't willing to do. For example, like people go on like these like 30 day diets, like, yeah, like they lose a ton of weight because they're cutting their calories at, by a ton, but it's not sustainable. They're maybe able to do it for four weeks and lose 10 pounds, 10 or 15 pounds in those four weeks, but you can't live like that. Like doing like being in this massive caloric deficit all the time. So it really needs to be like a more of a lifestyle change in terms of like just knowing how much you're, you're taking in and being able to tweak that a little bit over time. It's really, if you're going to be consistent with results, it needs to be like a, like a sustainable lifetime change, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So like I said, I, that's where like counting calories and like being like really familiar with like portion sizes and about how many calories you're taking in every day. Um, I think is a really valuable skill to have. Um, and then one other point I was going to make, oh, just tracking what you're doing over time is so important. And I think with weight loss, because right, because most people are dieting for weight loss, right? Or even weight gain. It, it, it's, it's, it's two sides of the same coin. It's just, you can do it with weight. Just like weigh yourself every single day, write that number down. And then if the average, and then look at like the average of each week, because it's going to fluctuate a little bit every day based on a lot of different factors. But if you wake up, first thing you do, weigh yourself. Take the average of week one, average of week two. What's the difference between those two numbers? Is it up? Okay, then I'm gaining weight. Is that what I want to do? Great, I'll continue on that trend. 
Is it down? Okay, I'm losing weight. Is that what I want to do? And then I need to alter what I'm doing. So that's the way I would look at it. I wouldn't put too much emphasis or like weight on any particular like number on the scale for any given day. But like if you take the average of week one and you look at that versus the average of week two, that's going to be a pretty reliable indicator of what direction you're moving. So again, if your goal is to lose weight and the average of week one and the average is, if the average of week two is a little bit lower than the average of week one, great. Like keep it up, keep doing the same thing. Then if the next week it's still lower, sweet, keep doing the same thing. If the next week it's lower, great, doing the same thing. But if it starts to stagnate or move in another direction, then like the weekly averages, then it's when you have to look at to make a change. So for a, how about a middle school 12 to 16 range, what do they, what should they focus on? And uh, I guess after that, walk me through like a day, day in the life of Ryan Cotter in terms of what he's eating. So I think for a middle school person, one is to focus on make sure they're getting enough calories in general, especially if they're more than what they're doing because they're growing. Yeah. So it's going to be hard for like a middle school person going through puberty because for the most part, they're going to be gaining weight just because they're still growing. Um, so obviously you don't want a ton of excess body fat, but I would say with like a middle school athlete, like I would almost never restrict their calories, like, because their, their metabolic engine, is just like moving so fast. It's almost hard to eat enough for them. Right. Again, unless like the athlete is presenting with like a ton of excess body fat. Okay. Then you have a little bit of an issue, but most middle school kids are like skinny and they almost like can't get enough calories. So making sure they're eating enough, especially a lot of protein. Um, and then in terms of like a day of like what, like a, like a normal day in terms of like what I eat. Yeah. So we get a basis of like, you're telling me all the calorie intake. I'm like, Oh, I got to do it. But like, what does it look like in terms of what you're putting in uh, exercise wise versus what you're putting in your body on a, on a meal basis? Yeah. So like I said, like every morning, so like a normal training day at the facility is I would wake up, I would have uh, coffee um, but then nothing else. So just coffee. And then, uh, at the facility I would get, we have like these five egg omelets. So I'm getting that I'm getting like six pieces of bacon and then I'm, uh, having like two Chobani, like Greek yogurts with, uh, some fruit in it. So it's been a while since we've had a normal training day. So I should know these numbers off the top of my head, but I'm taking in like 850 calories, like 900 calories at breakfast. 850, 900. So that's the biggest meal for me by the day by far, like 900 calories at breakfast. And then for lunch, it's going to be like whatever vegetable they have. So usually like broccoli or asparagus um, or green beans or something like that. And then like two chicken breasts. So like the two chicken breasts are going to be like 60 grams of protein. And there's going to be some carbs in the, uh, some carbs and fat because usually like these, uh, these vegetables have some oil on it. But lunch is usually pretty small for me. So maybe that's another 500 calories. So we're at like 1300 calories now. So it's like oh, 900, 500. Um, so we're at like 1400 calories now. And then for dinner, I'm just going to do like a protein shake, but it's like a big protein shake, like 700 calories in terms of like peanut butter, like two scoops of protein, whole milk, things like that. So then that would put us at like 2200 calories. Um, and then throughout the day, i would probably have like one other like protein shake that's going to put me at like 500 or 2500 calories for the day so for me personally and i feel like i'm usually trying to maintain like a lower weight i'm usually taking in like 25 2600 calories a day um and then that can be like 181 like 182 183 stuff like that but it varies a little bit like if i'm at training like if we have an injured player and i'm doing a lot of fitness with him like i'm going to eat more because I just need to eat more to be able to keep up with him. But like, if I'm just doing like normal strength training throughout the day, like a normal practice throughout the day, I'm eating like 25, 2600 calories, something like that. And then like on a Sunday, say, I know I'm not going to do much. Like I'm not going to do like a lot of total movement. Um, I'm not going to work out. Then I'll try and keep my calories down to like 1900, 2000. So it's going to fluctuate a little bit by in terms of how much activity you're going to do that day. You do and that's just, like if you're a bigger person, you're going to need a bigger amount of calories where I've noticed if, I, if I'm eating like 25, 2600 calories a day, my weight stays pretty consistent and like 200 grams of protein. Whereas if I, if I were to cut my calories closer to like 2000, 2100 calories, 
uh, and my activity level stays the same, I'll slowly start to lose weight. And if I, if I bump up my calories, like 2,800, like 3,000 calories a day and keep my normal strength training, I'll start to gain weight. So it's kind of like, and for my body weight, it, it just works out pretty well. Closer to 2,000, I start to lose weight. Right around 2,500, I kind of maintain weight. Closer to 3,000, I start to gain weight. So it's pretty easy to manipulate those numbers. Are you tracking like how many calories out you're getting? Like, do you wear any type of like fitness watch or anything like that? Or do you just kind of? No, you just, so that's where like the weight comes in. If you're gaining weight, you're taking in more calories than you need. Uh, if you're losing weight, you're not taking in enough calories. So that kind of like work, you don't need like a calorie expenditure account because your weight just tells you the number. Again, like if I'm consistently losing weight, I, I definitely, I'm eating less than I'm expending. Like that's how weight loss works. If I'm gaining weight every week, uh, then I know I'm eating more than what I'm expending. Like that's how weight gain works. And if I'm keeping pretty consistent, then I'm like, I'm, it's about equal. What is your, what's your, what's your timing? Like when, like, when do you, when do you eat your first meal? When do you eat breakfast? Do you do any type of fasting? It's like me personally, I've been messing around with doing the intermittent fasting the past couple months. And as not being an athlete anymore, for me, I've felt that like it helps me I feel way better from it and stuff, but I think a big part of it too is just that whole just restricting your calories, like just not eating this, like this portion of the day for like 16 hours of the day. Like obviously it helps me not to just overeat or anything like that. But for you personally, do you have any thoughts or feelings on fasting for yourself or athletes? And do you, what do you do for timing with your meals? Yeah. So for me, I don't do any fasting and then like my meal timing is dictated by when practice is. So we practice at 1030. So I'm eating at like nine. Um, and then our practice is old. By the time like guys are done with the weight room and things like that, I'm eating again at like 130. Um, and then I'm usually like having a protein shake after I work out. So say that's like four o'clock and then going home and eating dinner at like six o'clock. So mine's just kind of dictated by like our training schedule and like when I get a chance to work out. So that's pretty easy. I don't do any intermittent fasting. Um, and I think there are some there are probably some hormonal benefits to it uh, for certain people. Like everyone's going to react differently, but some people feel better when they go long times without consuming calories. Um, so I think there's a little bit of a, like a hormonal benefit for some people where they actually just feel better when they're not eating as consistently. Um, but the number one benefit, if it's, if your goal is to lose weight, the reason it works for losing weight is because you're eating less food. Yeah. Like it has nothing to do with like, Oh, 16 hours without eating food. There's nothing special about that except for you're not eating food. Yeah. So the total calories throughout your day is going to go down. I mean, that's how every single diet works. Again, athletes are a little bit different, but like general population, like if your goal is to lose weight, every single diet, it's just a different way to eat less food. Yeah. So like the Atkins diet, it's like, oh, I'm cutting out most of my carbohydrates. Okay, if you're going to eat less carbohydrates, you're probably not going to replace all those carbohydrates with a ton more protein and fats. So you're probably going to eat less food. But in your case, the intermittent fasting, if you're only eating eight hours a day, you're just inherently probably going to eat less food. Yeah. Um, if you're on like these um, like paleo or like caveman diets, again, it's like you're just cutting out so much of your carbohydrate you're probably eating a little bit more protein and fat just to make up like for your hunger needs, but you're probably not going to make up all of it. So yeah. you're just eating less food. So every, every single diet is a different way to eat less food. Yeah. yeah. I feel like that's part of the benefit too, is just thinking in my head, it's like, all right, if I only eat eight hours and then it's that whole thing where it's like what the actually calories are made up of. It's like, if I eat eight hours, like I don't feel as bad about if I eat like shit one day and just mm -hmm. don't eat well, it's like, all right, at least I, at least I fasted and, and not eating this all day, all night. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I, I cut weight for outdoor and I go to like 190 sub 190 and then indoor, I go to like 195, 196. So I've sort of been maintaining at 190, but it's interesting in terms of, uh, cause I guess, is it, if I don't get the, what's more important? You said like calories, but well, how about I get the, 2,500 calories, but my protein, I'm 190 and I get 160 in a protein. Uh, the number one thing is going to be calories in terms of changing your weight. And then secondary to that is the macronutrients, but it, it doesn't matter if you're eating. So say you're eating 2000 calories and it's hundred percent protein. You're still not going to gain weight 
if you're burning 2,500 calories. The number one thing is in terms of weight gain or weight loss, it's just pure calories. Secondary to that is going to be the macronutrient breakdown. And then after that, it's going to be like the nutrient timing. Then after that, like the nutrient quality. And then after that, like any supplements to fill in the gaps. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just literally impossible to gain weight if you're not in a caloric surplus. And it's physically impossible to lose weight if you're not in a caloric deficit. Awesome. Um, how are we doing on time here? We're, we're about to wrap it up. I got, I have one more, like, pre, one more question I wanted to hit on that I got off the of Twitter. So you, I saw something about you, I don't know if you tweeted it or retweeted it or just replied to it, but it was basically talking about how coaches will get better results from their athletes when they test them in the afternoons versus in the mornings. Yeah. Um, and with that, like I've heard some stuff where it's like, all right, if you're getting better, like say with weightlifting, like if you can just lift more weight volume total and are getting better results, like your muscles are going to grow more. If the fact that I generally coaches are getting better results in the afternoons, does that mean that it's, they're just training at a higher level in the afternoons for, for some reason. And it's like more beneficial to train in the afternoons as an athlete. Cause I know a lot of people like to get their training in, in the mornings, but if you're getting better results in the afternoons, does that mean you're, or, you're testing better in the afternoons. Does that mean you're like training better too? Yeah. So it's more from a new neuromuscular standpoint than anything. It's just your body runs on a rhythm where you're going to have like, like a peak hormonal profile um, and like a peak alertness from like a neurotransmitter standpoint and things like that later in the day. So don't quote me on this. I would have to look back at exactly what time it is, but I want to say it's most people are like kind of peaking physically between um, like 11 and, or I'm sorry, one in three, I could be wrong, but I want to say it's like one to three. And the, where I first noticed it is, um, so we, you, we test our athletes. So when I was working with the Academy here at RSL, we would test our athletes once a week on the force plates and once a week sprinting, like max sprint speed, just measured on their GPS. And, um, like they're young kids, so they're constantly improving. And then there, there was 50 some, I want to say 60 some kids. So every single week, someone would hit a personal best, right? Like not a single training session or like testing session went by where someone wasn't hitting a personal best on their vertical jump or someone wasn't hitting a personal best on their max sprint speed, except for if we test in the morning. So if we would test in the morning, like right before or even right after practice when they're fully warmed up, like barely anyone would ever do well. But when we test in the afternoon, everyone in general did well and we would always have people set PRs. If that makes sense, there would be sometimes PRs in the morning, but just way less. And like the, just the total shift, if you looked at like the average of everyone's max sprint speed and the average of everyone's vertical jump, it was always way down in the morning. Um, and it's just your, no matter how much warm up we did, um, no matter like what we did the day before in terms of how rested the athletes are, no matter how much sleep they got, anything like that, your body just not peaking for most people. Again, there's going to be tons of like interperson variation, yeah. But in general, your body's not peaking till later in the day. So like in the afternoon. And it's not to say you can't perform quality work, but if you're looking at something maximal, so like a sprint speed or like maxing out on bench press or like max vertical jump, like something that's like max effort that requires a lot of neural drive, you're almost always better doing it in the afternoon. So you think if you had someone that is a person in two alternate universes doing the exact same things, in terms of nutrition, sleep, training, and they just, one universe, the kid just does the same exact thing at 8 a.m. every day. One universe, the kid just does the same thing at 2 p.m. every day. The kid doing it at 2 p.m. every day, you think is going to get more output? In theory, I would think so. Um, but very rarely are you doing maximal things. So yeah. I was, when I was t talking about that, it's just for like testing something maximal. So like say you're training at 10 a.m. versus training at 2 p.m., like, like a lacrosse practice, like how, how often are you doing something like maximal, maximal, like jumping as high as physically possible or sprinting as hard as you can, like not that often. And then even when you are doing those things, you're going to be able to do them at like 98, 99% of your normal capacity, but maybe not like that quite hundred percent, but the rest of your practice is going to feel the same because those are sub maximal activities. Yeah. So I get what you're saying. Um, I don't know how much of a difference it makes. Right. I just know from my experience, if when you're actually testing like a maximal ability, something that requires a lot of neural drive, you're always going to get better results in the afternoon. So whether that means 
practice in general would be better in the afternoon. I, I think maybe in theory, but I don't know how much. So I guess I said all that to say is like, if your team like always trains at 10 a.m., that's what the time that works best for the coaches, the time that works best for the players. I don't know whether I'm training at 2 p.m. or I'm moving training at 2 p.m. and inconveniencing everybody based off this physiological fact. Um, Cause I don't know how much of a difference it is in training, but if I'm like testing for the combine, for example, and like, or yeah, if I'm like testing for the combine, it's like really important that I do this bench press. I do this vertical jump. I do this 40 yard sprint max effort. I'm for sure doing that in the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. My thing was just like, if you could say get one more rep on your bench press in the afternoon than the, in the morning, would that be more? Yeah, I would say so for sure. Yeah. You're going to be, almost everything that's like a maximal effort, just like physical capacity is in general better in the afternoon. Okay. Based on my experience, and I want to say some stuff I've read too. I've, it's been months since I've read it. So don't quote me on the one to three thing. Maybe it's 11 to one, but it's definitely not like 7 a.m. Like, I mean, it's pretty obvious. Like you're just going to have a depressed neural activity earlier in the morning. All right. So we'll, we'll start wrapping it up here. This has been, this has been great. We'll hit you like three last little hit, quick hitter questions. Um, so if if you read or if you could recommend one book for people to read, what would it be? Um, just one book to give as a gift to people. What would you pick? So like strength training or just a book in general? Either, either whatever you feel more passionate about. So my favorite book in general is uh, *Sapiens*. Have either of you heard of that? Yeah, I've heard a lot of good things about it. Yeah, so it's this book by this um, like I think I believe he's. Uh, history professor at Hebrew University in Israel. Yeah, he, um, go ahead. Pretty sure he's been on like the Joe Rogan podcast and I heard him talk. Okay, sweet. Yeah, his name's uh, Yuval Noah Harari. Um, and he's great. And it was just so interesting to me. One, I really like history. And it was just like uh, a recount of history that I'd never heard before. Yeah. Where there is so many like crazy facts that are like true. And I'm like, how did I not know any of this? Like in terms of like how many, like at one point, I want to say there's like like eight different subsections of um, like not homo sapiens, but like homo, so like humans, there's like eight different types of humans, like living on earth in different parts of the world at the same time. Um, and right now, like homo sapiens is obviously what has prevailed and there's only homo sapiens around at this point. But at one point there was homo sapien, there was homo neanderthal, there was homo divisian, I want to say was one that lived in like East Asia. Um, it's just the fact there are other types of humans that live for millions of years. And a lot of the time we were coexisting the, on the planet at the same time. And like in terms of like homo sapiens and homo neanderthals, like in close contact mating, like I know there was some stuff that came out that there's a lot of, um, there is a little bit of homo neanderthal DNA in like, um, a lot of European homo sapiens. Um, and just like for me, like groundbreaking stuff that like, how did I not know any of this beforehand? Like this is such an important part of history. Um, and just other things like talking about like the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution and how like these type of movements towards farming and then towards um, like machinery and industry and things like that, like have vastly shaped like the human experience um, and how we view ourselves and how we view the planet and things like that. It was just, for me, so interesting. Yeah. I've heard really good things. I don't think he was, he might not have been on Rogan's podcast, but they, they definitely talk about it a lot. Um, yeah. Most beneficial new habit or routine that you've picked up in the past five years? Uh, bullet journaling. Have you guys heard of that? No. So um, I actually have one right here. So it's just like a little journal. Um, and there's a specific, it's not like journaling like Dear Diary, this is what I did today. It's like journaling in terms of like tasks for the day and like reviewing like your tasks for the day. And there's, I'm sure a million different ways to do it, but I just read this book um, and it, it's worked really well for me. So it's like, you're right. So when you wake up, like you're writing down all your tasks for the day and then reviewing all your previous tasks, like for like, okay, what didn't I get done yesterday? Okay, you move that over to today's column and then any new thing you have to do today. So it just, it helps, it goes a long way in terms of just remembering what you have to do every single day and like forcing yourself to write it down and forcing yourself to like carry over tasks, I think is beneficial for it's like something like, oh, I had to buy a, an airline ticket to go home for my sister's wedding in a couple of weeks. And 
I'm just not great with that kind of stuff. Like I'll procrastinate, like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Oh, I'll do it next week. But the fact that like for like two weeks straight, every single day, like I open up my journal and it's like, okay, what didn't I accomplish yesterday? Oh, I still didn't buy that ticket. Okay. Then you write it again today. And then just over course of time, it's like, it just reinforces like, okay, I have to do this. I have to do this because I'm writing it down every single day. Um, and there's like a lot of other strategies that like laying out your week and laying out like personal goals, like for the month, for six months, for years that I just have found really beneficial, like staying organized. That could counter. We should write that down. We could, we could probably use that. Um, <laughs> anything, anything in the future that you're currently thinking about picking up, whether it be a new habit, something new you want to try, anything in your head that you're thinking about trying to add something new to your life coming up that you're kind of contemplating? I want to sleep more. Um, I think everyone does where I have a, I mean, it could be looked at like, a, it's not the worst habit in the world, but like when I lay in bed, like to go to bed at night, I always read, which is fine, but I need to, I think, start limiting it. Cause if I'm reading something interesting, I'll read for two hours and all of a sudden it's 1 AM and I got to get up at six and then, so I'm not getting enough sleep. So just be better about what time I, go to sleep every night, which sounds really boring and basic, but I've 100% noticed that when I'm getting enough sleep, I feel a million times better every single day. And I so often don't get enough sleep. And it's not because I don't have the time to do it. It's just because like, I'm usually reading, like I'll just read too long at night. So just being better with that kind of stuff. Are you usually reading stuff like Sapiens or are you usually reading like strength? Both. Yeah, both. Um, I would say lately I'm reading more um, or less strength training stuff um, just because not that I know everything, but like there's only so much out there that and I can definitely like I, it's not like that I don't read anything else, but I feel like I've read so many strength training books, read so many strength training articles, listened to so many strength training podcasts over the last 10 years that a lot of it maybe becomes a little bit redundant. Um, yeah. You can get more out of being like more well-rounded and person and helping with like, so kind of like what I said before about developing like a relationship with the athletes and getting them to be someone you, they like to be around is so huge. Yeah. Um, so like if you have like a bunch of guys in your team that you know are interested in one thing, and then if you are reading about that stuff and become knowledgeable about that stuff, that's just another thing that you can talk to them about and then like help develop a relationship about. Like we had a, for example, like a book club on our team um, that one of the players started. So sweet. I joined that book club. I might not have even loved all the books, but like now just every day I, I have something to talk about with every single player that's in that book club. Yeah. Um, and that just like helps the relationship. So for me, like those kind of things are infinitely more beneficial than just reading another book about sets and reps. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. When it comes to sets and reps though, do you have any, do you have like one favorite book that you've read with that stuff or like a favorite go-to podcast? Yeah. So there's a lot of good strength training books out there, but my personal favorite is called high performance training for sport. Um, so the two editors are David Lewinden and David Joyce. Um, there's actually a, a new edition coming out this year that I'm pretty excited about. Um, but what I like about it is just every chapter is on a different like physical preparation subject or performance subject. So like one chapter will be on fitness or like aerobic conditioning. One chapter will be on strength training. One chapter will be on plyometrics. One chapter will be on mobility, yada, yada, yada. And then each chapter is written by someone who's kind of considered an expert in the field in that. Um, so it's very like practical application. So like the strength training chapter is written by this guy, Dan Baker, who's like the head of the Australian like strength conditioning coaches association, or at least he used to be. Um, he used to be um, the head strength coach for the Brisbane Broncos, which are a big time rugby team. Um, so it's not just theory. It's like, okay, this is someone who's doing this at the highest level and this is how they do it. Like the sprint tr training chapter is written by this guy, Derek Hansen, who's worked with like Olympic sprinters. It works with a lot of team sports. So it's like, yeah, each chapter is written by someone who's actually like implementing this knowledge like at the highest level. So that book is really good. And then in terms of like blogs and stuff, um, there's a blog called Complementary Training by this guy, Mladen Jovanovic, who's a Serbian strength coach. Um, and it's expensive. It's $15 a month to be a member, but the, uh, the content is like top class. Um, so that's like from a blog that I like. Worth the 15 bucks? 
For me, yeah. If you're in the strength training profession, yeah. If you're just someone who's casually interested in like working out on your own, I would say it's not worth it. All right. All right. And then last one, last question, unless Connor, you got anything else? Um, Connor, good. I got a lot more, but we'll leave it to this last question. Yeah, I was gonna say this is part two. Yeah, I, I was. I've already been thinking. I was like, we're probably gonna have to cut this podcast in half, and then we should do a part two on top of that. Um, <laughs> but if you could, if you could put something on a billboard for billions of people to see every single day, what would you put on that billboard? I could put a billboard every day for billboard. Wow, that's tough. I wish you'd have given me these questions beforehand so I could come up with like an intelligent answer. And, uh, and it's funny, talking. yesterday, the guy we interviewed yesterday, he was like, what would you put on there? And we were just like, ah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but now I can throw that question back at you because you for sure have the perfect canned answer. Um, yeah, because I already, already thought about my answer from yesterday and wanted to change it, so. Um, oh, there, there's a quote I like. Um, I think it's Bruce Lee. Uh, it's like a... And it might be something I've tweeted before that you were referencing earlier, but uh, long-term consistency always trumps short-term intensity, yep. um, which I think like sums up for me, like training, diet, lifestyle, like anything, like to go back to like these different diets, like you can do anything for a month and like get good results, but that's like really high intensity, really short-term. And then you, I mean, like the statistics of people that, like lose all these weights on these diets and then get back to their pre diet weight. It's like, it's like 80% of them, like hardly anyone can sustain it. So just long-term consistently consistency when it terms of diet, when it comes to what you're doing in the weight room, um, when it comes to anything that you do in life, like that is, it's so much more important than just like going all out for like a short amount of time. Cause you're never going to be able to sustain that. Yeah. So develop habits every single day and just kind of, it sounds so boring, but like with diet, I think the biggest thing that with, with diet is just for me, I just eat the same thing every day. And I, I know that's impossible for some people, some like foodies that really love food. But like for me, it's whatever. Like I just eat the same thing every day. Like I don't care. Yeah. Um, and then just having that consistency long-term, you're able to get the results you want. Same thing in the weight room. Like so many people will like work out super hard for like a month or two and like gain some muscle and like lose a little bit of weight. But like, you just need, you can't sustain that high level intensity for a long time. It's just better to get in a rhythm and just go every single day. Um, and kind of along those same lines, I think there's like a, it's like a um, Bill Gates quote where like people, people always overestimate what they can accomplish in a single day, but underestimate like what they can accomplish in a year. Right. Something along those lines where like people are always like, oh, I'm going to get X, Y, and Z done today. And you, there's no way you can get all that done in a day. But then on the flip side of the coin, people really underestimate if I read for 30 minutes a day, just 30 minutes, like how many books I'm going to read in a year. Yeah. Like, like you're going to read 10 books in a year if you read 30 minutes a day or, or something like that. So, yeah, I think it's all just consistency, doing a little bit of what's important every single day. Doing a little bit, a lot of it. Long yeah. game. Long yeah, game. the long game. You got to be in it for the long game. Long game. Let's go. All right. I think that concludes – Part one. <laughs> yeah no let me know I've, uh it was great seeing you guys enjoyed talking to you guys uh i know i probably talked a lot too much about soccer for a lacrosse podcast but it, I, it is great to talk about other things besides soccer yeah i mean it's all there's a lot of parallels in all the other sports yeah. and you know if we can get this to work out with lacrosse we hope to help out in other sports too so definitely doesn't hurt and we obviously saw you in a lacrosse atmosphere and saw you could do pretty good work in a lacrosse atmosphere as well. So we, uh, we respect your opinion and your, uh, your insight for sure. No, I appreciate it guys. Yeah, this is great. Disclaimer, soccer is not the best sport to train. Uh, no, I want to say that it's just, it's very different. If you love, if you're a strength coach and you love the weight room, soccer is not your jam, right? Cause you're just not doing a ton compared to like lacrosse or football the strength coach you said it though so yeah I, I mean i'll stand by working with lacrosse players in the weight room is more fun than working with soccer players in the weight room but for me personally i enjoy the overall experience of soccer a lot yeah, do what you love yeah all right well all right well i think that concludes Thanks, that. Tyler, I appreciate it. all right
Appreciate, Appreciate it, guys. We'll talk to you soon.